When you first start learning about IP addresses, or at least IPv4 addresses, there comes a point where you'll start to wonder, why don't we just run out of all of these IP addresses? Every single device needs an IP address, after all, in order to communicate on the internet, but this 32-bit address that's made up of four segments and each one can only have a value between 0 and 255, that only gives us a total of 4.3 billion possible IP addresses. But then we have to subtract all of the addresses and ranges that can't even be used on the internet, like addresses that are beginning with 10 or 192.168. Those are all reserved for private networks. You're never going to see them on the internet. Uh, same thing for the entire 127 range. Every address that begins with 127 is reserved for loopback addresses. So after we subtract all of these, we're only left with about 3.7 billion usable public addresses. And surely this isn't enough since half of the world's population owns at least one cell phone or a computer that they regularly use to get onto the internet. The engineers that came up with the IPv4 addresses, they never thought that the internet would be used by almost everyone on Earth on a daily basis. So how is it that we've managed to avoid an IP address supply crisis? Well, the first trick, and what this video is going to be about, was network address translation. So this removed the need for every single individual device that needs to communicate to have its own IP address. So think about how devices connect on the internet. Your desktop, your laptop, your phone, they're all probably connecting to a single router in your home, either through a wireless connection over Wi-Fi or through Ethernet. And this router acts as your gateway to the internet. You need it to get on the web. It only has one connection that's going out to either the telephone pole or to a satellite dish that allows you to reach the rest of the internet. Since all of your devices are using the same gateway, they really only need that one public address to receive data, the IP of the gateway. In fact, if you have more than one device in reach right now, go ahead and look up what your IP address is on both of them. Pause the video, check your IP on your phone and on your laptop, and as long as you're not using a VPN, they're going to have the exact same public IP address. Now this might seem like some digital wizardry, but really it isn't much different than how normal mailing addresses work. So you and your roommate have the exact same street address. So when both of you receive mail, it's going to have the same street, the same house number, city, etc. The only difference is the name that is on that package. So to the mailman, the name on the package really doesn't matter, like it doesn't matter who, what person it's actually addressed to. He's only making sure that the package arrives at the right house, and then it's up to the occupants of that house to figure out who gets what package. So let's take a look now at how exactly this network translation works. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that there are addresses that are reserved for private networks, uh, private network just means the same thing as your local area network. So basically, all of the devices in your house are going to be connected to one router. Uh, each one is going to have its own private IP address, usually beginning with 10 or 192.168. Uh, and you can actually see these addresses by running an IF config on your individual devices, or you can just log into your router if you know the credentials. Uh, and then you'll see every single individual private IP address for all of your devices. Uh, each one is going to be unique, and this is assigned to you automatically by your router when it has DHCP enabled, which it should be, unless you hate yourself and you like to manually assign IPs for some reason. Now, when you communicate to a server on the internet, you aren't just talking to a specific IP address, but you're also talking to a specific port depending on what service it is that you want from the server. So 
uh, like with youtube.com, you're gonna want normal HTTP traffic. Well, technically HTTPS, but we'll just use HTTP for this example. Uh, you're going to want that because you're going to want to get a website. So you're gonna talk to port 80. If you wanted FTP traffic, then you'd be talking to port 21, so on and so forth. So there's a destination port and a destination address for that particular service on that particular server on the internet. And there's also a source port and source address for you to receive responses on that also specify what machine and even what application you're running on that machine to receive responses to. Because obviously, you wouldn't want to get your torrent traffic mixed up with your browser traffic or your Windows update traffic. Now, the port that is used for your source address doesn't have to be highly specific like it does for the destination address. It really just has to be unique. So in this example here, I'm using port 8899 to receive HTTP traffic to, let's say, Firefox. So the router then translates this IP address and port into the public IP address and port that's seen here. So this is really going to be our return address for the communication that is going to YouTube, that it's going to send back to us. At the same time, your router is creating an entry into what's called a NAT table. So this is where it keeps track of the public IP address and the port that is being used for each communication stream and the private IP address and port that identifies that exact computer and application making that connection. So when the router receives some traffic to its public IP from YouTube in this case, it looks at what port it's for and then translates that back to the private IP address and forwards it along to the computer. So when another computer shows up on our network, it's going to have a different private IP address assigned to it by the router. And when it goes to connect to youtube.com, that address is going to be translated into the router's public IP address and given another unique source port to identify that connection. And the source port that these two computers are using could actually be the same because they're just assigned randomly by the OS whenever you open up a new connection stream. But since they have different private IP addresses, the router would still be able to uniquely identify them. So these could both be using 8899, but because they have different private IPs, it could show up over here as 192.168.15.8899. 168 or 192.168.16.8899. Same port, but different address, so it's still unique. And the NAT table is just going to use a unique port for every connection because, again, this NAT is always going to have the same public IP address, but it's just going to use a different port for each application. And these ports are usually temporary, so this first computer, it got the source port 8899 for the public IP address. If this computer shuts down, or even if just the application that's open shuts down, like if you close Firefox, then this connection is going to be closed and it's going to make port 8899 available again. So if a third computer comes on, it's most likely going to use that port. If this guy wants to power back on, then he's gonna to have to get another unique port. He'll probably get 8901 since that's the next one that's in the list. NAT can usually allow for up to 64,512 unique ports. So it's excluding the 1024 well-known uh, TCP and UDP ports, the first 1024 ports. So this allows a router's single IP address to be broken up into tens of thousands of unique streams, which is more than enough for households and even small to large businesses, vastly reducing the amount of unique IP addresses reserved on the internet. Now, these days, there's also IPv6 addresses, which I'm not gonna go into too much just to keep this video short, but these are designed completely differently. So. They are 128-bit addresses instead of 32 bits. They contain eight groups of four 
uh, digits, and each group is going to be made up of four hexadecimal digits. So their value can be 0 through F for each individual one. And all of these changes mean that we have a total of 340 trillion, trillion, trillion usable IPv6 addresses. So there's literally more IPv6 addresses available than there are grains of sand on the entire Earth for multiple Earths. Like, it's pretty crazy. We shouldn't run out of those addresses for the foreseeable future. Uh, there's also some other differences with IPv6 besides just its massive address space. But like I said, I'm not going to go into that here. But if you do want a video that's all about IPv6, let me know in the comments down below.